Hey, what's going on YouTube? Thanks for tuning in with me today. Um, so today I wanted to talk about um, alcohol and spiritual enlightenment. Um, this is a, a challenging topic for a lot of us. And um, I used to be one of those people who thought people that didn't drink had an easier life or um, they just they hadn't experienced the type of things I had and it was just like easier for them like oh they probably didn't grow up with parents that drank and they weren't ex uh, exposed to these types of things so it's just easier for them like I watch um, Ralph Smart a lot um, Lior um, there's a lot of YouTubers that I follow Eckert um, Sadhguru and these people a lot of them seem to have like these perfect lives and after I started digging a little bit deeper, I found that a lot of them um, used to drink. And this is my second go at sobriety. Um, last summer, I did a six week detox of um, no drinking. And I was meditating every day and um, it was really powerful. Um, and, and then I relapsed. Um, and so, and I, I really want you to stick with me on this video because this video is not to sound preachy and that you need to quit drinking. I want to explain to you how people are able to give up alcohol and be happy because I'm like you. I had just the thought of quitting drinking gave me this intense anxiety and I just felt like I'm going to be missing out on all of this fun and how will I socialize and how will I have friends and it would just give me this severe anxiety so stick with me and um, we're actually going to talk about how you can do this and you don't even have to fake being happy you will find genuine joy at the end of this journey um so like i said i relapsed and then started drinking like hardcore every day relapsed more drinking than i had even before i did that six week detox and so Recently, I started again sobriety. This time, I set a mission for myself. I'm never drinking again. I didn't do that the first time. This time, I said, I'm never drinking again. I'm on my third month, and I feel amazing. But I want to tell you kind of what happens in that transition when you're going from... Um, because if you're, working on a, if you're working on law of attraction, if you're working on manifestation, if you're working on living your best life and being your best version... Um, and you drink, you're gonna get to this point. It's inevitable. You're gonna get to a point of, shit, I need to stop drinking. And you're just gonna block it out. Like, ugh, you don't wanna think about that. And then that's gonna end up kind of blocking you from going further. And so um, I just really wanna dig down into that subject. And uh, all right, so I watched, first I wanna tell you a little bit my experience and then I'm gonna tell you um, something that I kind of learned. Um, first off, if you, if you say, I'm going to slow down on drinking, um, I don't drink that much. I don't have a problem. That's okay. That's okay. That's a start. Okay. So I don't want you to beat yourself up, but if you're kind of feeling like, you know, this, I do make bad decisions when I drink, I do feel depressed when I don't drink. I do feel like I'm missing something. If I don't go out, then this video is for you. All right. So you're at this point where drinking is affecting your life negatively. And the thought of giving it up is giving you anxiety. I wanna tell you my experience and then I'm gonna tell you sort of the journey and what it will look like and that I promise you that feeling will go away. Okay, so you say you decide that you're gonna quit drinking or take it easy. First things first, if you don't set a goal such as I'm never drinking again, you're gonna go back to your old ways. Even if you slow down, wherever you were, like let's say you were going out and blacking out and ending up at random places or passing out, we've all been there, right? Um, when you slow down, if you don't set an extreme goal for yourself, you're gonna go back. Um, and, all, and furthermore, if you, don't, if you do set an extreme goal for yourself and you don't follow it, you're gonna feel really shitty. So I'm gonna tell you how to do both. And what I did wrong last summer, when I did my six week detox, is I didn't do the inner work to really understand why I was having a drinking problem in the first place. 
and I didn't do AA. All I said was, I'm not going to drink for now. And I didn't set a goal. Um, I just, I, I abstained from alcohol, but I didn't, I didn't examine why I was drawn to it. And then we had a family reunion and I don't live near my family. I don't live by any of my family. My daughter's kind of close, but um, I might need to close these blinds. The sun's going crazy outside. I'm sitting in front of a window. Anyway, um, we'll see. So anyway, I did it. Um, so I, I don't live by my family and I didn't prepare. I didn't do any of that inner work during those six months. So I go to this family reunion and oh, did I relapse. I was drinking so much. And then I came back from that reunion and, and furthermore, just about everybody in my family is an alcoholic. They, they won't admit it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's extreme binge drinking with the whole family. And, um, and kind of having been through that six weeks of not drinking and spending time alone and then going straight into the pit, um, it was quite traumatizing. And I didn't even really realize it at the time, but when I came back home alone, I went into the deepest depression that I've ever been in and I got downright suicidal. I've talked about this a lot in my videos and how I was suicidal last summer and that's kind of what led to it. I felt like I had let myself down because I fell back into heavy drinking and um, I just didn't want to live and I didn't know why. And so I continued drinking for about nine months and then um, had another significant event happen. Um, it wasn't suicidal this time, but as I also talk about a lot that I started my own company and um, I almost lost my team um, because we were all drinking together. And um, I have worked, you know, for a couple of years on this company and almost lost it just like that over a week, a weekend of binge drinking. And so as a team, we made the decision not to drink anymore ever again. And um, number one, it made it easier because I had somebody to do it with. And um, number two, I actually started looking at, OK, what? Um, what do I need to do to not drink? Okay, like Russell Brand is somebody that I follow a lot. Um, and, you know, he used to be a drug addict and a bad alcoholic. And he's so woke now and he seems so happy. <clears throat> and he has like a lot of videos on recovery. And I used to just tune those out. I would watch his spiritual videos, but I wouldn't listen to the recovery ones. Those used to trigger me. Um, if this triggers you even sitting through this video, keep listening. I promise there's really happy goodness in this. Um, okay, so I finally started being open-minded to what, because when I became an entrepreneur, I, I mean, I don't really believe you can become an entrepreneur. I kind of think you are sort of born an entrepreneur and you either step into it or you don't. But we ha some of us have that feeling like we know we shouldn't be working a nine to five and we should be doing something to help other people or something. Um, but anyway, when I really stepped into entrepreneurship, I'm going to close these blinds. Hang on guys. Hopefully that's not too dark. All right. Yeah. I think that's actually a lot better. Okay. So when I really stepped into entrepreneurship, um, I read every single book on success. I was following everything that Steve Jobs did. I was looking at everything, um, Bill Gates did. I was studying Oprah and what Think and Grow Rich and all of these success books, Tony Robbins, like you name it, I've probably read it. And I just became obsessed with the topic. I still am. I still obsess over these. Peter Diamandis, oh my gosh, those books are so good. Um, check out Abundance, um, Bold, and The Future is Faster Than You Think. Um, those are great books. Anyway, and I'm still obsessed with these topics. So I followed what successful entrepreneurs did and I just immersed myself in this culture. And it started coming kind of naturally. And I mean, getting comfortable just not knowing what the hell you're doing and having faith is pretty much what it boils down to. Um, but that said, I was so resistant to doing that with alcohol. And so finally, after it, it really became real when I almost lost my company, but I was like, all right, alcohol is negatively affecting my company. And it's time to look at this. And so um, I finally became open to seeing, I sort of approached it like I did with entrepreneurship, where what did successful people do that recovered? What did they do? How did they do it? And I couldn't find one person that, and bear with me, you guys, bear with me. I couldn't find one person that had done it without AA. 
and I was like, ew, I do not want to do AA. Ew, ew, ew. I just had such a negative outlook towards AA. And this is during the lockdown and everything, so there wasn't any AA. I'm like, okay, I'll just look it up online. And I find this online 24-7 AA group. And I went the first day that I decided I wasn't going to drink, I joined. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't want to be here. Um, scared to death. I feel like I'm going to lose my company. But all the successful recovered people say that you need to join a group. So here I am. And what I learned really quickly, like after like a couple of days, these people were so open and welcoming. And guess what they were talking about? They weren't even hardly talking about alcohol. They were talking about spirituality, my favorite topic. They were talking about meditation. And this group of people was so woke. Now, there were a couple weirdos in there, like, because it was like a giant Zoom meeting. And I don't mean to be judgmental, but there were a couple people that were like, um, belligerently drunk, clearly, or on drugs in the Zoom call. And that was kind of off-putting to see <laughs> like on a, I'm trying to be sober and there's people that are obviously shit-faced in here but it's like okay just have compassion towards them you know but anyway the majority of the group was so supportive like you can do it Danielle you got it reach out anytime and I immediately found a sponsor and so I reached out to her we started talking for like an hour every night she was giving me homework um and so I did it very consistently for about three weeks and I bought the big book is what they call it, the big book. Um, and this book is a, it's an enlightenment book. It's a book to spiritual awakening. Um, I'm going to be honest. I haven't been reading it as much as I am supposed to per AA. And I haven't been going to the meetings that much anymore, which is a huge no, no in the community. Um, but honestly, I feel like, and this is probably my ego talking. I don't know. Um, I feel like I have so many of these spiritual awakened qualities in me. I had just never applied them to drinking. Um, but I want to tell you what happened. I'm not saying you have to join AA. I'm not saying you have to buy the big book. I just want you to hear out this story. And I want to tell you what happens as far as anxiety and fear. And when you quit and FOMO, fear of missing out what you feel when you decide to let go of drinking and what that experience looks like and um, what you have to look forward to, you guys. It's not a bad thing. So I just kinda wanna go through my timeline. So yeah, it's been three months and um, the first month, what you're gonna do in AA, and I don't know if you have to join or not, you guys, it's all a personal journey. I'm not gonna tell you, you have to do what worked for me, but I think the story could be relevant. Um, the first month, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're not going to drink and you're going to pause when you feel like drinking and you're going to think about what you're feeling. And when I did that at first, the que the answer I kept coming was like, I just want to have fun. I'm bored. And it's funny how we kind of lie to ourselves and we think that we just want to have fun and we're bored. Um, after about two weeks of and meditating, just being still and joining a meeting. Um, oh, and I also was really mean to people, especially my roommate slash co-founder. Like I would get angry and anger is a big thing in AA. And so every time I feel angry, instead of me kind of being bitchy to her, I would go for a walk. I would call my sponsor and almost every time it would end up being a conversation about my family. What? Where is that coming from? Why am I thinking about my parents? Like, what is that about? Like, I'm not triggered by my parents. They don't cause me to drink. That's what I thought. Um, or my siblings or whatever. And, and so I started working through this. And it is so interesting that the more still you are and the more you don't react on your emotions or feelings, even if that feeling is, I don't want to sit still. And that was a big one for me. Like I love to like in the evening, um, walk with my dogs, go to um, a bar down the street and they have a patio. They bring the dogs water and everybody's super social. And it's a nice liberal crowd, which very open-minded, all different types of people, different ethnicities. And we don't talk politics, but it was just really open. You can really kind of be yourself there. And I love that bar, I still do. <laughs> I haven't been back because I don't trust myself going there, but 
um, in the evening, I really liked to go there and it was super fun. And um, that was kind of my, my jam. Well, when I was doing this detox, um, I don't feel like I'm detoxing anymore. I, I honestly feel like I beat it, but I'm not, um, the reason I'm doing this video is because I want to be honest with myself, um, that I am not stronger than alcohol. Alcohol is a poison and it is addictive. And so I don't want to have my ego telling me, oh, I beat this. So I'm doing this video to sort of hold myself accountable and also try to help somebody else. Okay. So I, I was really, um, really struggling at first with feeling like I was missing out with my friends and my little social group that I would go hang out with and have beers with. And it wasn't like blackout drunk. It was just two or three beers. I would meet fun people and they were really fun. And then I would come home and go to sleep and still be productive. But those two or three beers would turn into four, would turn into five. And I would not feel like working out in the morning. And maybe I wasn't as productive as I like to say I was. Um, maybe I felt a little bit ickier than I felt. Maybe I ordered some food that I shouldn't have ordered on Uber Eats and I wasn't quite vegan that night. And just doing things that weren't the end of the world, but that I really knew better then. That I, I knew I had set higher standards for myself and I wasn't following through. I'm um, sometimes smoking cigarettes, um, you know, just not just not being true to my best version. And I just, you know, Sadhguru says something so powerful one time. He said, um, doing the wrong thing takes so much more effort than doing the right thing. Because doing the right thing is, is hard in the moment, but doing the wrong thing, like being a couch potato or drinking beer or eating the wrong food or not meditating, you have to justify that to yourself. And so you're like, well, I didn't do that because I wasn't feeling good because of this. And then if I get this right, and sometimes, yes, you do need to rest and you do need to be still, but you know, oh, well, I'm going out to this bar because I'm going to be social and that's going to raise my vibration and that's going to make me meet more people and I can promote my business and that and all these lies that we tell ourselves that we could do without drinking. We could do all of that without drinking, but we justify it by all of these reasons and then we feel icky about it. So then we, we don't want to face that. So what do we do? We probably drink more or just stay busy so we don't have to deal with letting ourselves down and not following through on that goal that we said we would make. So anyway, yeah, the, the wrong decision takes way more work than doing the right thing. If you do the right thing, you just got to do it and get it over with. And then there's no justification. You're, you feel so light, you know, like when you work out, you feel light. You don't feel guilty about working out when you eat healthy, you don't feel guilty. So it's like, or if I can make these hard decisions now, then I'm so light. And when you're light, you're vibrating really high. I told my daughter this the other day and I didn't make up this quote. I don't know where I got it from though, but I said, um, hard choices today make easy tomorrows. Hard choices today make easy tomorrows. Mmm, what? <laughs> Slow motion this side. Mmm. <laughs> Y'all know what's up. And so, um, it's so true and the hard choices to, and easy choices today, conversely, easy choices today make hard tomorrows. And so, yeah, when you're doing those, those little justifications, you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to face that. And if you don't face it, you're going to have to numb it. How are you going to numb it? Drugs, alcohol, food, TV, whatever. And I, I'm not saying that food and TV are bad. They can be, um, depending how you use them. There's a lot of positive things on TV and YouTube, but if you're just binge watching, drinking, binge drinking and all these things. Um, and yeah, there are some people that can drink and just be social, but I, I, it was messing up my life, you guys. And, and one thing I want to add that a lot of people, when you quit drinking, a lot of people think you're like judging them if they drink. Um, and that they can't drink around you. And, and I did ask that people not drink around me, but I found recently I can be around people that are drinking. For example, my sister and daughter came to visit me for my birthday and they drank. And I thought it was gonna be a trigger for me. You guys, I had no desire. I drank kombucha. I had fun. I had so much fun. I did not wanna drink at all. I realized like, I feel high on life, but it wasn't easy to get to that point. So. 
I want to explain to you the trajectory of how you get to this point of being high on life, going from justifying doing the wrong thing, having to numb your feelings because you're mad at yourself for letting yourself down to being high on life. How do you get to that point? All right. First things first, you got to start a, you got to make a goal. If it's, you're not going to drink for a month, that's good. But the thing is, if you reward yourself by binge drinking, what was the point? Why do you want to quit drinking? Identify. Why do you want to drink, quit drinking? If you want to quit drinking because it's becoming negative in your life, then it's probably going to inevitably be you can't ever drink again. Because if drinking is causing you pain and suffering, that is telling you that you don't have control over it. And it's got to go away completely. So I challenge you to, if you want to be high on life, then identify what is keeping you from that happiness. And if alcohol or drugs or food, whatever it may be, if whatever this addiction is, is causing you negative effects, if you're having that negative side effects, maybe falling out with friends and family, maybe not being productive, being overweight, lethargic, sleeping in, angry, there's a reason for that. So back to, back to the family reunion. I relapsed so bad. So then I go to AA, right? I'm talking to my counselor or my, um, my, uh, what's it called? Sponsor. Gosh, sorry. That name just, I lost it for a minute. Um, so I was talking to my, um, my, um, sponsor. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time remembering that word today. And all the conversations ended up going back to my family. And about two weeks into sobriety, I was sitting one Saturday night and I just got flooded. Thank God I was with my roommate and she's not drinking with me also. I got flooded with memories from childhood and my teenage years of um, violence, abuse, gaslighting from my parents. And it hit me. It's so weird. If you, if you have issues with childhood, and we almost all do, and you've sort of tuned them out, when you... Um, allow yourself to remember that is probably the scariest thing in the world. Um, people that don't have that, I don't think they understand how scary it is to face your fears of childhood. Um, it was fucking scary. The feel, I felt like I was going to die. This feeling of fear was just so overwhelming and it, it felt like a dark demon. Um, and I know that might sound dramatic, but I was just like, <sighs> and I realized, like, I told my roommate, I was like, I feel like I really need a drink right now. <sighs> and I was just like, almost going in, I was like going into a panic attack. And she was like, do you want to talk about it? And I, I, my response was no. Then I was like, wait, that's my old response. Yes. I want to talk about it. Yes. I remember things and I, I just started saying the things that I remember and I was honest. I was some of the, I was like, you know, I don't remember exactly how this came out, but I do remember this. This definitely happened. This definitely happened. This is how I felt. I remember this and, um, and talking through it and then just kind of breathing. And, and this is the first time I had done this. I said, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's okay to remember. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't have to run away because that would have been a time where I'm going to say, I would have just, I wouldn't even allowed it in the past. I wouldn't even allowed it to get to that point of me remembering. I would have just hurried up and went and went social, socialized with my friends and had beer. Um, and this time I, I didn't, I was like, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. And I honestly, you guys, I felt like I was going to die that night. I felt like I was just going to downright die and I did it. Um, I talked about it for a couple hours. I cried. I sobbed because it was the first time in my life that I allowed myself to be honest with myself. The first time, 43 years old. I just turned 44, but I was 43 when this happened. This was a few months ago. And, um, I didn't think there was 
any light on the other side of that. I thought this is going to be my new normal is this dark demon feeling of just fear, this cloud of doom. That's what I felt like. Um, but my, my friend hugged me and she just, she said, I'm putting a bubble of protection around you and I got you. And just like energetically, that was so powerful and I needed that. I encourage you, if you're going through something similar, find a friend, find somebody you trust that, um, you know, you can talk. We can do this in the comment section if you want, you guys. I will do that for you. I will send you good energy and I want you to know that it is okay. And there is light on the other side. And you have to allow yourself to kind of experience that pain that we were told wasn't valid, that we were told was our fault, that we were told we remembered wrong. We have to allow ourselves to sort of experience that, how we remember it to happen. And we have to say, you know what? That is what happened. That is what you experienced. And it's okay. You're not in that reality anymore. You survived it. Your memory is valid, but you survived it and now you're okay. You have to remember so that you can heal. And you guys, this is essential for being high on life, is that you have to go through that funk to go through that happiness. You have to go through that because the thing that is making you drink, what alcohol does, is our body, our mind is trained, our subconscious mind is trained to that, to where like when, when we feel like we don't even know we're feeling it. It's like, have you ever like been on a diet and then you find yourself eating? You're like, what the hell am I even doing eating? I wasn't even hungry. That's a program. Um, we do the same thing with alcohol where you'd kind of like go to um, a dopamine releasing. Oh, I want to talk about this dopamine video too. We'll get to that. But you go to like a, an, an, um, a, uh, it, it, sorry, I'm struggling with my words today. Um, an immediate, an immediate dopamine releasing, um, device such as alcohol, fat foods, desserts, sugary foods, um, sex. That's one, um, any of these things that can be addictive because they give you an immediate dopamine release, um, what our brain, what our subconscious brain does is it, um, it release, it, it trains us to go to those dopamine things, um, with, as a, um, defense, as a sort of a safety net so that we don't have to face those scary, painful things. If somebody's saying, so like, let's say if you're in a healthy environment, right? And you experience something scary, like let's say you witness, um, someone getting hit by a car. I'm, I'm saying that because I actually witnessed that. She was okay. Actually, my roommate's a doctor and she was able to take care of her. It was really powerful. It was a blind lady that was coming around. The car was coming around the corner and they didn't see her and she didn't see the car. Um, it was really amazing, actually. she was a, My roommate was a badass performing because I like freaked out and she just ran straight to the lady and helped her. Anyway, um, but if you're in a healthy environment and you witness something traumatic, everybody is like, Oh my gosh, that everybody comes together. They're hugging, they're supporting each other. They're all worrying about the victim. Um, everybody's like, she had a dog, she had a seeing eye dog. And so I took her dog and I'm like loving the dog, just keeping the dog calm. I love dogs. You guys know I'm such a dog person. My roommate's taking care of the human. I'm taking care of the dog. And, um, but we all came together. There was, cause there was actually, it was in the apartments at the clubhouse and there was actually, um, like a some kind of party going on. I can't remember if it was like a Christmas party or what it was, but it was something going on. And so there were a lot of people where it happened, like maybe 20 people were outside, um, sort of not everybody witnessed it, but they saw the lady run laying down and then the cops came and the ambulance came. And so anyway, um, everybody was coming together and supporting and making sure that the lady was okay, making sure that my roommate had everything that she needed to take care of her, making sure that the dog was okay, um, making sure that um, the, the girl even driving the car was young and she had just gotten, I don't know if she had just gotten her license. She was like 18, I think though. So she probably hadn't been driving for very long. Not probably, she definitely hadn't. She was traumatized as well. She felt awful in this corner. You really can't see. So it wasn't even her fault either. They need to put like a 
speed bump or something at that corner. I don't know what they can do, but anyway. Um, and so my point of the story is when you're in this positive environment, everybody comes together and everybody's, everybody's experience is validated, right? Everybody is um, acknowledging how everybody's like it was traumatizing to get hit. Obviously the woman was the true victim, but it was traumatizing for the girl that hit her. It was traumatizing for the dog. It was traumatizing for those of us who witnessed it. And everybody's experience is validated and we all helped each other out. Now, conversely, if you're in a negative environment or a toxic environment, such as the one that I grew up in, your experience, if you witness something traumatic, it will be, no, that's not what happened. No, that's not, um, no, you're remembering wrong. Um, don't tell anybody about this. This is private. You don't repeat those things about your family. And what that does to your psyche is um, you don't get to process those emotions. You don't process the trauma that you went through um, because it's sort of paused. It's paused. It doesn't go away. It 100% does not go away. It's paused. And, um, you know, comparing it to the experience with um, the lady getting hit by a car, we all dealt with it because we were all validated. But in childhood, when something traumatic happens and it's not validated, it festers. And what you have to do if you're, especially if you're a child and you don't have a safe place to process that trauma, it kind of gets pushed back into your subconscious mind. And what you're programmed with is like your parents are telling you, you can't, you're not allowed to feel that. You're not allowed to. And when you're growing up, you know, you constantly have your parents sort of being the one to like force that out of your conscious mind. But when you go into adulthood and you don't have your parents there to kind of force you to not remember this or not process this, you're going to have to rely on a substance. You're going to have to rely on drugs or alcohol or food or sex or any other addiction, shopping. Um, there are all kinds of addictions that um, are going to sort of make your brain not function as it would healthily. Like alcohol, it inhibits your brain activity. And that's kind of what we're going for. Drugs slow your brain down or they can um, kind of make you think about other things um, so that those emotions, those unprocessed feelings don't come back up. And so when you do detox and when you quit drinking, that's the first thing that's gonna come back up. And it's really difficult because number one, you're detoxing from something that you thought you really enjoyed doing. So you feel icky because you're detoxing. And on top of detoxing, you're flooded with really difficult things. You're flooded. Things that you didn't even know you forgot. Things that you didn't even know you were suppressing. And I would be lying if I told you it wasn't overwhelming. It is overwhelming. This is why you go to AA. This is why, because none of those people had it easy. None of those people had it easy. Everybody has to go through this. And the reason AA is so powerful is you guys, you do not have to do it alone. Further, you shouldn't do it alone because when I tried to do it alone last summer, I relapsed not only did I relapse, I went around the main people that were triggers for me, not even knowing that they were the triggers because I wasn't doing the inner work, sent me to almost killing myself. So not only should you not do it alone, don't D utilize, utilize AA because even if you don't even believe in what they're saying, at the very least, they're supportive and there's going to be people there for you 24 seven that you can call and tell them, hey, I'm feeling some type of way. I'm angry about this. I feel like having a drink because of this. I'm having an anxiety attack. Literally, I'm not kidding. Three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the afternoon, 10 o'clock in the morning, doesn't matter. They are there. And you guys, they will have your back and they don't judge. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And so I, I will say this, and, and the only reason I haven't been doing the AA um, lately is because um, I've still been reading and I've been doing the meditation every day, and I, I need to call my sponsor. You know, I think I'll call her. Maybe I'll send her this video. What up, girl? <laughs> I'll send her this video when I get done. Um, 
Um, I do miss her. And, and, you know, the sponsors also say that by helping others, um, that's actually, I think the 12th step of AA. And I think I was on like the fourth step. Um, I need to look back at the book. I never did my four step homework. Um, and then, there's no excuse. Um, I just didn't do it. So I need to, I'll do it. I will, I will do it. Um, but the 12th step is, um, helping others and that helps you stay sober. Um, and so I kind of feel like this is sort of a version of the 12th step. Not that I skipped steps. I definitely need to work through them all and I will. Um, but anyway, the, I'm, I know I'm rambling, but, um, the reason this group is so powerful is because they're, you don't have to go through that. They've been through it. Okay. It's so powerful. I used to think that AA was going to be like all churchy and Jesus and da, 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 da. It's not like that at all. You guys, it's, um, it's like, I feel you're going to feel like you're alone when you quit drinking and then you join this community and all of a sudden they're like, Oh yeah. Do you feel like this? Like, yeah, you get it. Oh my gosh. You totally get it. That's exactly how I feel. And so it's, um, it's so, it actually makes that fear, not that kind of that panic that you're going through, like remembering things that you've been suppressing. Um, it makes it a lot easier to deal with. Now, I want to tell you how long did that last? That lasted and it didn't happen overnight. It gradually got to sort of, um, this, oh my God, this fear is overwhelming to kind of gradually going away. And I will tell you the fear part lasted for about a month. It lasted for about a month. I went through being afraid of the dark. Um, and yeah, but what I'm, what I'm going to tell you what it led to, and this might be hard for some people to hear, but, um, what it came to is for me to um, really process is that um, I realized I have to distance myself from my family. Um, I don't know if that's forever, but that's for now. And um, my memories are valid. My emotions are valid. I remember what happened and I am not going to lie to myself to, um, prevent my parents from feeling guilty. And I feel like that's sort of what I've had to do um, for a large majority, for the majority of my life. And um, I won't do that anymore. Um, I don't want to talk bad about them or be angry at them. I'm, I'm working on forgiveness, but um, to get through this, um, you know, to get through this um, fear and to validate myself and identify what gave me a drinking problem. Um, I have to identify the triggers and, and they have to go, you have to get rid of those triggers. And you know, if people aren't, and don't get me wrong, some people you can talk to, you can talk to and say, Hey, you know, this is a trigger. Could you please not do that anymore? And a lot of people will be very open and um, listen and not do those things anymore, but some people won't. And um, if they're not, and if they're gonna inhibit your sobriety, then you just gotta let them go. And that is, you know, that's how it is. And so, oh gosh, I gotta take this thing off. My, <laughs> you guys, I hurt my arm really bad yesterday. Totally sober. It's really swollen right there. <laughs> I'll tell that story another day. No alcohol involved though. <laughs> it was a hot mess. <clears throat> anyway, um, <clears throat> it involved kayaking. It was a lot of fun. Um, I don't think it's broken, but I had, I've been having this compression thing on it for like a few hours and I, my hand was like going to sleep anyway. So, um, so, so yeah. Um, so this video, well, okay. So I want to finish telling you the, um, the, the, uh, the fear and depression that feels overwhelming. Now that part that you don't want to you that's the thing that's the thing that always prevented me from getting sober before and that is so temporary and so like i said i i cut my family off not all of them but most of them and um i just started validating myself and you know saying uh, my memories are valid my emotions are valid i'm okay and meditating on healing and just kind of working on my inner child and those types of things um and you guys, I started feeling so much better. And I mean, I'm talking about high on life where that desire to drink has went away. I walk past bars and I'm like, yeah, I have no desire to do that. Like I want to kayak. I want to jog. I want to work out. I want to walk with my dogs. I want to read. 
all of these, I'm just really starting to enjoy life. And um, it's just starting to feel like pure bliss. So I'm gonna link this video about how to train your brain to do hard things. Um, it's a really powerful video. Um, but one thing that they don't talk about in that video is that sort of time frame of where you like re replace quick dopamine releases to slower, small dopamine releases. And um, there's a gap of time that you're going to have to go through this kind of funk, but there is like um, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and the rainbow is sort of the hard part. Um, but, but do the work. It, it's like you're going to go through about a month. Yeah, I know that month is going to seem like forever, but go through it. It's going to be worth it. Don't think you're turning into this deep, dark, depressed person because it's so temporary, you guys. Um, I really hope this video helped you. I cannot believe I've been talking for 40 minutes. Um, I hope this video helped. And if you want to share your story, um, if you're struggling with drinking, if you're struggling with substance, eating, drugs, smoking, or anything unhealthy, and you guys, I'm not perfect. I still vape. Um, I have a jewel. I'm not advertising it. Um, that's the next thing I'm working on getting rid of, but it's a process, right? Our spirituality, um, our path to enlightenment is a process. Um, and you know, we get there over time and it's a journey. It's not a place, it's a journey. It's a constant journey, even though some people, blah, whatever. Everybody has their own path, right? We all have our own path. And um, I wish you all love and light and please, you know, share if you want um, some support. I will be happy to give you um, any recommendations, any knowledge. Um, I'll reply to your comments in the comment section. So um, give this a like and subscribe and um, yeah, talk to you next time. Mwah. Love you.